Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Outlaw Nation show. I'm the Outlaw John Roca here, coming to you live today to talk about this incredible, interesting, unsettling, frustrating, uh, anger inducing, God damn it, why doesn't he get it interview that Joss Whedon did with Vulture writer and New York mag editor Lily Shapiro. Uh, she talks about all the accusations, pushes back on all the allegations, uh, clarifies some of the allegations, takes responsibility in some instances, just to be fair, for some of his behavior in the past. And it chronicles uh, the time that she spent interviewing him over multiple interviews uh, and really kind of paints an unsettling picture of Joss Whedon. And I'm here to talk about it. You know, I read it this morning. I read it over twice this morning. And I'm like, I got to do something. I want to talk about it. So I'm going to I'm going live today to talk about it right now in the afternoon here with you all. And uh, we'll go through the entire interview. We'll go through piece by piece, paragraph by paragraph, through the whole interview. You know, I did this with the uh, with the um, uh, other interview there with um, uh, with the Spider Man uh, with Amy Pascal. Rather, I was thinking Amy Trask, who's a friend of mine, but Amy Pascal. I did that with the interview she did with Fandango when she was teasing the possibility that Tom Holland was coming back for a new trilogy. So I kind of want to do the same thing here. I want to break it down, kind of look at everything he said, and I'll, I'll lower myself in the box and put the interview bigger so you guys can uh, read along with me as we're going through it and break it down and of course i'll jump through some of the other stuff that's you know like just frivolous stuff from from his past and and, and stuff like that in terms of his upbringing all of that but we might touch on it might keep tabs on it to bring it back to some of the comments that he makes later on in the interview when he's talking about or defending himself against these allegations and against some of the things that he said now I'll warn you guys now some of this stuff is uncomfortable to hear some of this stuff is very frustrating to hear. I mean, he essentially pushes back on everything Ray Fisher says and accused him of and says Ray Fisher was a bad actor in both meanings of the phrase. He blames Gal Gadot's uh, allegations on a misunderstanding that English is not her first language, which is really one of the most stupidest things I've ever heard. As a person who is the son of immigrants, I take that incredibly personally when someone says that who is a native English speaker to someone who is an immigrant uh, or who is uh, not an, a native English speaker. Uh, she's worked hard. She's a very intelligent woman. She understands the English language, for God's sakes. And there was some of that. He called the um, Justice League actors when he was there on the set for the reshoots some of the most rude actors that he's ever worked with. Uh, they were inflexible to his uh, approach to uh, this whole reshoots and the reboots here, though, the reshoots he was trying to do for Justice League. And he also goes into some of these allegations with Charisma Carpenter, of course, from the set of Buffy, some of these other things that have been uh, alleged as well. And before I get into the interview, just want to remind you all to please hit that like on this video. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, hit that subscribe button and hit that bell button. You know, it's called the Outlaw Nation because we're not afraid to talk about stuff like this, deal with it, get raw about it. This is what we're all about here on the channel. So if you're if you're a fan of that kind of raw, authentic, and unfiltered approach to content, entertainment content, then the Outlaw Nation is a place for you. Please hit that subscribe button and hit that bell button. And if you're watching this later, leave a comment down below with your thoughts about everything we covered here, your thoughts on the interview, and hit that like button as well. The Streamlabs and the Super Chats are open. If you want to send in some support for everything we do here on the Outlaw Nation, you want to have your question read here as we're going through everything, I'm happy to do that and address the question as we go along. So the Streamlabs address is right there on the screen. It's also in the description of this video. I'm going to pin it to the chat in just a second, and we'll get going from there. But first, I want to jump into, well, actually, I should pin it first. Now, thank everybody's joining me right now. Almost 70 people joining me right now, which I really appreciate. Thank you so much. Uh, and let me see here. Let me do that for the outlaw. All right, there we go. I'm going to pin this, uh, pin this in the chat. Um, and then you guys, if you want to send in some, some support, you can send in some support here, uh, and we'll go from there. So let me see here and put it together. There we go. All right. People leaving comments already. I love it. I love seeing an active, uh, chat. I love seeing you guys ready to go, ready to talk about it all. I really appreciate that madly. So thank you very much for uh, joining me here this afternoon. Hope you all are having 
uh, a good Martin Luther King uh, Jr. holiday. Uh, those of you might be having the day off, those of you celebrating the great Martin Luther King Jr. and everything he did uh, for this country and for this world, I hope you're enjoying that as well and taking a moment to remember him and watching Selma or watching the great uh, uh, Jeffrey Wright play Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, as well and other things that are going on, that other content that relates to Martin Luther King Jr. as well. All right, so before we jump into this, I just want to go through the timeline of these allegations for Joss Whedon. This is compiled by Vulture Magazine as well. I want to give them a lot of credit here. Once again, Lily Shapiro's interview. I want to give proper credit. Fantastic interview here. Uh, you can follow her uh there uh, on twitter if you want to she is fantastic really enjoy the work that she does and uh it, this was a lot of fun to jump into in terms of the kind of uh access that she was able to have and what she was able to uh get from joss whedon in this interview you can follow her at lila pearl l-i-l-a-p-a-r-l -L -L on twitter if you want to follow more of what she does and of course follow her writing on vulture magazine and what have you all right let me see let me jump into here and so in 2002 uh, they chronicle that there were issues on the on season six of buffy uh, uh dealing with allison hannigan's character and this bury your gaze trope for those of you who are uh, buffy fans you know exactly what i'm talking about allison hannigan who played uh willa rosenberg becomes the big bad of the season after falling into the deep end of the magic following the tragic death of her girlfriend and they were trying they were essentially uh, uh pilloried for attaching willow's interest in women and magic with her evil dark willow transformation this was an issue as well and then in september 2002 firefly got some crap as well because of how summer glow's character was connected to trauma and it, they left her it left her with erratic psychic powers and yet she was still infantilized and placed under men's control then season six of buffy was happening around the same time and a uh, high school mean girl turned heroine cordelia chase was played by charisma carpenter left the show due to uh, with a widespread dismay from the fans after falling in love with angel she ended up fall, going after angel's son connor through some weird multiverse multiverse dimensional stuff overall and um uh, charisma carpenter teased in 2009 at a uh dragon con that she had these issues with joss and that maybe that was the reason why she uh her character went this direction then they eventually killed her character off when she came back for the 100th episode as well then in february 2009 he did the series dollhouse with eliza dushku uh jt knows who eliza dushku is uh but yes yeah, this was a a series that focused on a group of young attractive women who are called dolls who sell themselves to a secret agency that wipes their memories and lends them to the rich for a variety of reasons usually sexual and assassination and this got a lot of uh, a pushback from people who were saying that you know he's essentially kind of saying this is okay or validating this in some way whether indirectly or directly then 2015 we have avengers age of ultron and there was a, a lot of uh, people going against the misogynistic take on black widow how she was essentially turned into this sexy character for bruce banner and then claims her inability to have children with being a monster she correlates her inability to have children with being a monster feeling like a monster and so a lot of women came after him joss took off, turned off his twitter uh and uh he was accused of turning it off because of uh, feminists coming after him but he told buzzfeed later that this was quote horseshit and that quote militant feminists have always been after him quote every breed of feminism is attacking every other breed because god forbid they should all band together and actually fight for the cause and in 2017 the wonder woman script that he had written leaked and that was uh, just all kinds of uh sexism uh, was uh, were the accusations of sexism uh, throughout with diana her curvaceous body uh they uh, described it as an over sexualized body to save the world um and it was over and over again in that con in that uh, uh script that you that it was being reaffirmed how sexy she was reaffirmed how sexy she was uh, maybe Paul Thomas Anderson should have taken a page from that. Stop doing that all over licorice pizza for a lot of hame as well. Then November 2017, this is when the explosions started to happen around uh, Joss Whedon. All that other stuff was kind of murmurs in the background. There were people who tried to shine a light on it. But it wasn't until Whedon's ex-wife, Kai Cole, wrote a guest blog for The Wrap. Uh, called Josh Whedon is a hypocrite preaching feminist ideals. And then in it, in the article, uh, it, she detailed secret affairs that Josh Whedon was having with her, with uh, the women that he cast in the shows with other women, with people who were assistants on sets, things of that nature. 
15 years later, Cole says her ex-husband wrote to her saying, when I was running Buffy, I was surrounded by beautiful, needy, aggressive young women, right? It wasn't him. It was those women. They were the needy ones. They were aggressive ones. It felt like I had a disease, like something from a Greek myth, of course, trying to make himself grandiose, of course. Suddenly, I'm a powerful producer and the world is laid out at my feet and I can't touch it. She also claimed that he confessed to hiding numerous affairs, physical and emotional, with some of his actors, co-workers, fans, and fans and friends after the initial affairs on Bobby, uh, Buffy, rather, he claimed that the piece had inaccuracies and misrepresentations, but wouldn't speak out directly against it because of his children and out of respect for his ex-wife. Then in uh, July of 2020, James Marsters, who played the fan favorite villain turned hero uh, vampire Spike, shared that Weed once backed him into a wall, disparaging him for his character's unforeseen popularity in the series. And Marsters revealed this on the Inside of You podcast with Michael Rosenbaum. He said, I came along. And I wasn't designed to be a romantic character, but then the audience reacted that way to it. And I remember he backed me up against a wall one day and he was like, I don't care how popular you are, kid. You're dead. You hear me? Dead, dead. Uh, and he says, I was just like, uh, you know, it's your football, man. Okay. Uh, and then uh, Spike entered in Buffy into season two and became a mainstay through the end of the series with an on and off relationship with Buffy. Buffy. So uh, that's what we're saying. So, and then July 1st of 2020 is when the Ray Fisher allegations started. He uh, shared a clip of him once calling Whedon. Oh, he's uh, Ray Fisher, best known for playing Cyborg in Justice League and Batman v Superman, shared a clip of him once calling Whedon a great guy, saying, I'd like to take a moment to forcefully retract every bit of this statement. A few days later, he followed it up with tweets alleging Whedon's abusive behavior toward all of the cast and crew, not just Ray, on the set of Justice League. Uh, and then on July 12th, it was reported that Whedon's abuse was not limited to those on screen, but to employees behind the scenes. Sophia Crawford, who worked as uh, Geller's stunt double for the first four seasons of Buffy, told Metro Magazine last year, uh, that was in July of 22, that she left the show after Whedon gave her the ultimatum to either end her relationship with stunt coordinator Josh Pruitt or leave the series. Pruitt called Whedon an egomaniac who told the couple that no one will ever hire you again after this. This is a running trope a uh, running phrase that uh, whedon uses from something like old hollywood you know you'll never work again in this town that kind of nonsense in november whedon exited the nevers um i interviewed uh, um a couple of people from nevers uh and at the time whedon was still there so interesting stuff here uh he exits the show was filming a big budget science fiction series during a global pandemic uh, HBO just said we have parted ways with Joss Whedon. Then in January of 2021, earlier last year, Fisher announced in a lengthy Twitter post that he would not be returning as Cyborg in the upcoming Flash film and that he would never work with DC Films president Walter Hamada, calling him, quote, the most dangerous kind of enabler. And in his original tweet about Whedon, Fisher also called Jeff Johns and John Berg enablers of Whedon's behavior. Whedon does not make any public statements. And then February 10th, a month right after that, is when Charisma Carpenter came forward to speak about the trauma that she endured on the set of Buffy at the hands of Whedon. She tweeted a statement that detailed the history of being, quote, casually cruel. Carpenter said that Whedon made ongoing passive-aggressive threats to fire her, called her fat in front of her colleagues when she was four months pregnant, and once asked her if she was going to keep it, referring to her pregnancy, right? So just giving you a little bit of background here, and the, the other uh, Buffy co-stars step forward to support Carpenter, including David Boreads, Eliza Dushku, and Sarah Michelle Gellar. They're proud to have her name, uh, even Sarah Michelle Gellar, who said she was proud to have her name associated with Buffy Summers. I don't want to be forever associated with the name of Joss Whedon. And Amber Benson, who played the lesbian witch who made television history as Tara McClay, backed Carpenter's claim, saying Buffy was a toxic environment, and it starts at the top. Like most toxic places, ladies and gentlemen, it starts at the top. If the top guy or gal doesn't understand that their behavior bleeds down, bleeds down and affects everybody below them, and they, in essence, have to take on this toxic behavior in order to survive in a toxic set, that from Ellen DeGeneres to all kinds of sets where the toxicity goes from the top down, this is the kind of shit that's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. And on the same day, Michelle Tractorbird, who played Buffy's little sister, and uh, Dawn Summers came forward and said that Whedon was not allowed in a room with her alone while shooting the series. She was a teenager. Because this must be known as a teenager with his not appropriate behavior, very not appropriate. The last comment I will make on this, there was a rule he's not allowed to room with Michelle again. She was, uh, Trachtenberg, now 35, entered the series at 14 years old. And then February 12th of 2021, 
Jose Jose Molina, Molina corroborated Benson's claim that Buffy was a toxic environment. He tweeted that it was casually cruel, is a perfect way of discussing uh, describing Joss Whedon. Fisher gave an extensive interview in April of last year to The Hollywood Reporter detailing all the ways that Whedon clashed with the actors and mismanaged the sets. And Gal Gadot confirms, confirmed reports in May 8th of last year from a source in The Hollywood Reporter that Whedon threatened her career behind the scenes on the Justice League reshoot, saying that Whedon pushed Godot to record lines she didn't like, and when she objected to the inconsistency in the character in an interview with the Israeli outlet N12, Godot said, what I had with Joss basically is that he kind of threatened my career and said if I did something, he would make my career miserable. I handled it on the spot, she said. So that's the background here that we're dealing with before we jump into this interview. Just wanted to give you guys a little bit of heads up here. I appreciate everybody joining. God, 160 of you all joining me live. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Please make sure you hit that like button and leave a comment down below if you're watching later. And remember to subscribe to the channel down below. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that bell button so you see when we're dropping all the content just like this, the live content that we do here. Also, uh, the Streamlabs and Super Chats are open. I've pinned it in the chat, I believe, here. It's in the description of the video. It's right there on the screen. And uh, uh, now let's jump into this interview. And I do want to hear from you all what you think. So send in your Streamlabs, send in your Super Chats so I can pull them up on the screen or read them and address what you think as we go through this interview. Okay, I'm going to switch the brand to do it like that. So the Streamlabs still up there. Let's share the screen now. Uh, and let's see. Let's share the screen now. Let me bring it up. You know, I'm just one man, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just one man. All right. Let me see. No, that's not the one I want to share. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Sorry, y'all. Let's see. Oh, yeah, well, actually, that might work if we go through it here. That actually might work. Okay, so this one is called The Undoing of Joss Whedon, the Buffy creator, once an icon of Hollywood feminism, is now an outcast accused of misogyny. How did he get here? So let's start with the interview here. It says, in the fall of 2002, 160 scholars convened at the University of East Anglia, Norwich, England. They were an eclectic group of theologians, philosophers, linguists, film professors. They had descended on the medieval city for a conference dedicated to Buffy the Vampire Slayer, a, Slayer, a cult television show about a teenage girl who fights monsters while attending high school in California. And there were life-size cutouts to talking about. Professors stalked around in long black leather coats like Vampire Spike. And in the line between scholarship and fandom was vanishingly thin. So was the line between fandom and worship. On the first morning of the conference, David Levery, a professor of English at Middle Tennessee State University, MTSU, stood at the podium and declared the show's creator, Joss Whedon, the avatar of a new religion, the founder of a new faith. They go on to say it wasn't just scholars who worshipped him, worshipped him in those days. He was celebrity. He was a celebrity showrunner before anyone cared who ran shows. In 2005, the comic book artist Scott R. Kurtz designed a T-shirt that gestured at Whedon's stature of the pop culture at the time. Joss Whedon is my master now we let uh, Marvel later put, put him in charge of the Avengers and Age of Ultron uh, and all of this. And uh, he had fundraising efforts for, for progressive causes. And he seemed like a good guy. Look, and I remember these days of Joss Whedon. I remember the days of Joss Whedon being the nice guy, being the guy who took care of business, who like had these fundraisers, who wanted to be the person uh, on top of things. I remember that Joss Whedon. That's the Joss Whedon that I had thought about for quite some time and uh, believed was this person who understood and accepted progressive causes, was was kind of out there as a man pushing, uh, you know, feminism, pushing female leads in shows. So certainly he was engendering a lot of respect and, and, and love from the fan community and certainly from a lot of women's groups as well. There were some women's groups who came out against him, as I detailed earlier. They saw the patterns here back on the later seasons of Buffy. So certainly it wasn't something that just popped up and all of a sudden everybody grabbed it. It had been building. It had been building, but there were enough people on the other side who were in support of what he was doing. Then it goes on to say this interview here in 2017 with ex-wife Kyle Kai Cole, sorry, published the sensational open letter. Then we have all the detail of the accusations. Then Charisma Carpenter's accusations as well. Talking about how fan organizations de debated changing their names because of all these accusations. People on discussion sites wrote anguish posts. As Sarah Michelle Geller, who played the titular Slayer and other Buffy stars, offered words of support for Charisma Carpenter. Then this past spring, here's where a lot of uh, gets into. She says this past uh, uh, that Whedon invited me to spend a couple of afternoons with him at his home in Los Angeles. Now, I want to make sure that I'm sharing this so you guys can see it, so I want to make it bigger. Uh, I don't want you guys to not be able to read the interview with me, and I certainly don't want any other 
stuff going on. So this past spring, he invited me to spend a couple of afternoons with him at his home in Los Angeles. By then, I'd spoken with dozens of people who knew him after months of agonizing over whether to grant my request for an interview. He had decided to talk. So Whedon, who lives in Santa Monica, 13 blocks from the ocean, and she talks about his house. Uh, he said, describes him as pale and angular with bags under his eyes um, and no longer resembled the plump cheek puck who once impishly urged a profile writer to describe him as doughy and jowly. He even says the sun is my enemy. She mentions that scattered around the room were paintings by his wife, the artist Heather Horton. They recently got married last year in February of 2021, just after the wave of allegations had crested. He said the, then the garage door opens. She's coming back. Um, she uh, He picks up a cup of tea. Whedon said he could no longer remain silent as people tried to pray his legacy from his hands. Here is the beginning of the ego. But there was a problem. Those people had set out to destroy him and would surely seize on his every utterance and attempt to finish the job. I'm terrified, he said, of every word that comes out of my mouth. Now, I love this kind of stuff, right? Because this is the defense. I'm terrified of anything I say could be misconstrued. I understand that. Certainly in our society now, in our social media culture, anything you say can be twisted and turned. I, in a very, very low-key way, I've had that situation. I've dealt with that situation with some of my tweets or some of the comments I've made on shows. Certainly I've seen that happen where people just twist things to fit the narrative they want to put you in, not the actual meaning of your words. I understand that. But you can say certain things like, I was wrong. I'm taking a look at myself. I ask for forgiveness and I'm going to work really hard to earn back the public's trust. So this idea that somehow you're a victim because you can't speak your truth is not true. You can speak your truth as long as you proper, uh, you're properly deferential, you're honest, you're authentic, and fans can sense that stuff. For the most part, the good fans, the mainstream fans, the fans that aren't willing to go crazy, the fans, those fans will understand and accept you if you're authentic. And I think that's really important to point out here. So it goes on to say that back when he was still a god, the kind that contractually obligated to promote network television shows and press junkets, Whedon was asked over and over again to explain why he wrote stories about strong women. For years, he would answer by talking about his mother, Lee Stearns, who died in 1991, who was an activist, an unpublished novelist who taught history at an elite private school in the Bronx. One of her students, Jessica Newworth, would go on to become a co-founder of Equality, now an organization that promotes women's rights. Newworth, who has cited Stearns as an inspiration, described her to me as, quote, a visionary feminist. Uh, and in 2006, Equality Now even presented Whedon with an award and an evening dedicated to honoring, quote, men on the front lines, unquote, of feminism. In his speech, Whedon referred to his mother as, quote, extraordinary, inspirational, tough, cool, and sexy. OK, sitting in his living room, he told me he sees a different side of his mom now is what uh, Lila is getting here in the interview. She was a remarkable woman, says uh, Joss. She was a remarkable woman and an inspiring person. But sometimes those are hard people to be raised by. Now, look, here's a moment where he's offering some vulnerability. Now, is it calculated? Possibly. Certainly having his wife's paintings around the room. So it feels like, you know, there's a woman here who is putting her touch on the place. It's very clear you're having a female reporter come and interview you so certainly you want to kind of radiate some kind of semblance where you're kind of uh don't want how can i say this way it seems like his approach i'm not saying you want to, i'm saying his approach is to kind of play on getting the women back on his side getting women to see him again getting women to uh, connect with him so this vulnerability talking about hey uh it's pretty hard to be raised by a remarkable and inspiring person I can understand that. Certainly people who are remarkable, inspiring can be quite difficult, can be quite uh, tough, can also be not there for you, you know, or can do things. I mean, we're talking about Martin Luther King Jr. today. We're celebrating him, but you can't celebrate him without also thinking about the fact that he, there is evidence that he cheated on his wife on multiple occasions. So there are things like that. You kind of have to make your own decision about things like that, how you factor that into your life and the things that you do and how you get raised by that. How can that affect you? You know, I just finished watching Chaplin this morning. And that movie from 1992, which is a bit troublesome to watch now, but from 1992, and it's about Charlie Chaplin and story Robert Downey Jr. But of course, there's stuff in his past and the stuff that he did with young women and young girls. And you're like, OK, he did this great film that completely uh, was a, um, a, a retort to Hitler and Nazism. But also there's this stuff where he has a propensity to be with girls that are in their teen, 15, 16, 14, 17 year old girls. It's really tough. And you have to make your own decision about how you feel about that, for sure. All right, so Whedon he says he's been talking about his childhood a lot. Apparently, he's been in therapy for the past few years. 
I'm a big proponent of therapy. Therapy has helped me a lot in my life. So when I read that, I thought this was a good thing. Checked himself into an addiction treatment center in Florida for a month long stay. Uh, he said he had, uh, well, she says that he had channeled his pain into his work, but was never interested in, in picking apart the stories he, he always told himself about his past. Now he didn't have much else to do. So now he wanted to jump in and work on himself. We go into a description of his upbringing there in the Upper West Side. Family spent holidays reading Shakespeare and listening to Sondheim, RIP Stephen Sondheim. He said there wasn't a grown up who didn't have a drink in their hand by mid afternoon. So an incredible description. Uh, his father, Tom, was a second generation TV writer who wrote on the Golden Girls' Dick Cavett. It lived through many writers' room battles. Uh, he said, if you weren't funny, entertaining, or agreeing with him, they would cut you down or turn to stone. Now, I can understand this. He's he's laying a little bit of vulnerability out. Now, his mom was tough to deal with. He was also raised in a pressure-filled environment where he had to be funny. He had to be enter entertaining. He had to agree with them, or they would absolutely eviscerate him. And I can understand that. Sorry, I'm getting some text here. And I can understand that. That's a really valid thing to be worried about as you're growing up in a difficult environment to be growing up in for sure. So I can't imagine there's a lot of, I don't know. I can't imagine that's the best situation for a young child to grow up with. Who's maybe sensitive. Who's maybe uh, you know, a little overweight. Who's maybe just got issues going on from the beginning of life. Maybe not the easiest thing. So I'm not trying to give him any excuses. I'm just trying to give a fuller picture here. Uh, it said he was the youngest of three boys, soft and slight anxious. He had long red hair, uh, caused people to mistake him for a girl, which he identified with the feminine uh, uh, when he was younger. He was, uh, she said uh, she was capricious and with, he said she was capricious and withholding essentially of affection. His mom he's describing here uh, and frightened him less than his father and especially his brothers who were admiral monsters who bullied the shit out of him. So already you're seeing the groundwork being laid of the fact that he was kind of a, in a bad environment and he was a trade, you know, he was uh, treated in a certain way. Uh, so he said he kind of disappeared, making up science fiction universes now. Uh, and he has a term for the damage his childhood caused, which is complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Now I'm no psychiatrist. I'm no therapist. So I'm not going to comment on what that is and isn't and the ins and outs of something like that, that I'm nowhere near qualified to do that. Um, and let's keep going here. He says, uh, when he was four, when he was five, a four year old boy, the son of family friends disappeared on his parents' property upstate. Eventually, his body was found. He had drowned in a pond. Years later, as a teenager, we'd remembered he had called the boy over to the pond to play with him. After getting bored, he had walked away, leaving the boy alone by the water. I didn't think it was my fault. I knew it was five, but it doesn't just disappear as a thought. So, already kind of laying these traumatic incidents out for people to kind of maybe get a little bit of sympathy for him. Is it calculated or not? Again, that's going to have to be up to you. Do you think it's calculated? Do you think it's authentic? Um, and the article or the uh, interview keeps going on to say that his parents split up when he was nine at 15. He said, I was very dark and miserable, hiding this little hideous, a little homunculus who managed to annoy everyone. And in 1983, his fortune changed. He arrived at John Wesley in university where he discovered his personality of being artsy and angsty could be attractive to women. He got a women. He got a girlfriend, traded his basic name for a more interesting one and found a mentor in a woman, Janine Bassinger, who was a film scholar. Um, so that goes on to talk about Janine Bassinger, who uh, espoused the artistic merits of the woman's picture, a genre that predominated in the middle of the 20th century. So seriously, so women are a very integral part of his life um, uh, from what we're seeing here. The groundwork's being laid about his mom. The groundwork's being laid here about his mentor. The groundwork's being laid here about how the men in his life uh, treated him badly or bullied him or a young boy he knew he might have indirectly been involved in the young boy's death or maybe had left at the right time before the young boy drowned who knows how much of that is actually accurate but this is what he's saying in his mind he said he admired strong women like his mother yet he discovered he was capable of hurting them usually by sleeping with them and ghosting them or whatever now this is something that you know when you're growing up eh, dating dating can be crazy dating can be weird ghosting all we didn't have a term for that uh, when i was growing up you know just, just kind of didn't talk call back anymore and hope that they would eventually get the message when you didn't call them back or you were the one being ghosted and you would call three or four times and when she didn't return your call you would after you're done with the excuses of oh she you know she doesn't know who i am or maybe she's busy you realize hey she doesn't want to see you anymore that's the game obviously so we talked about Whedon moving to L.A. where he met Cole and wrote the screenplay for Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which was the 1992 film directed by Fran Rubel Kuzai. Has that come up as a Schmodown question? I don't remember if that's ever come up as a five-pointer. All right, I want to tell a story about someone who turns out to be important despite the fact that no one takes that person seriously. He said it took him a long time to realize he was writing about himself and the feeling of powerlessness and constant anxiety was at the heart 
of everything that he was doing. His avatar was not a fearful young man, however, but a gorgeous girl with extraordinary courage. He wanted to be here. He, and this is an interesting line here in Vulture. He wanted to be her and he wanted to fuck her. Mm. Unsettling line. That's Lila's uh, interpretation here. It doesn't say his direct quote, but perhaps he said that and she is using that here in this interview. In 1995, executives at the fledgling WB network invited him to turn the idea into a series. And this is how it all happened, right? Like those women's pictures the Bastard had written about the show invited a multiplicity of interpretations. You can view it as a story of female empowerment. The tiddling tale of a woman in leather pants was brutalized by monsters. Um, and that's how most critics read it. According to Lila here, it was the late 90s. After all, 1998, shortly after Buffy's second season aired, Time published an infamous cover asking, is feminism dead? As the story's author, Jania Belafonte, noted the protests of the 60s and the 70s were long gone over, were long over rather. Gloria Steinem was defending Bill Clinton in the New York Times and the struggles for equal pay and childcare had been subsumed by the corporate pageantry of girl power, the glib spectacle of powerful women on television, essentially implying that the, that uh, studios had found this to be a marketable trope, girl power. There was an authenticity to wanting women to have power from, I'm sure, women in Hollywood, but there was, but this uh, Hollywood and that was mostly run, or almost all run by men. It's a patriarchal situation. They saw possibly there was money in this, so let's co-op this hire a bunch of men to be the showrunners for these women that's, that are, that's these shows that are starring women and in a way kind of put our interpretation of girl power out there to be consumed by the public. Uh, and it says this in so much of Whedon's work, the lines between good and evil were blurred. The good guys sometimes did monstrous things and the monsters could occasionally do good. But uh, he says the media likes, but she says the media likes a story with a clear cut hero. Whedon wasn't above playing the part. He said, the, uh, he told the LA times in 2000, I just got tired of seeing women be the victims. I need to see women taking control. And here's where it gets a little bit kind of twisted in his mind. And look, I'm just analyzing this and we're talking about it. You know, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to intentionally do anything. I'm his mind. He very well could have thought, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to have women in power, but in his mind, the women in power must always deal with the trauma. And look, every lead of every show deals with trauma of some level, some sort. Even Tony Soprano was dealing with the trauma of a very unsettling mother who might have had sexual feelings for him. Certainly there's a scene in Many Saints of Newark where you get that. So we get that vibe that's really uncomfortable, how close she wants to be to Tony at that dinner table where Ido Falco doing a fantastic job there with, with Gandolfini's son in that scene. And so, and certainly that was something that was pervasive throughout the series. So having a character who is traumatized by a parent, that's not unusual, but it's just the pattern here that was developing amongst all the female characters in the lead of his projects, this was becoming something that was getting to be pointed out uh, more and more as the years went on. Uh, yeah, the, it goes in more about us uh, talking about the subtext, subtext and talking about these things with, with Buffy. Um, they'd hold, he says that occasionally some of the Buffy stars and writers would gather at his house to watch the episodes. They'd huddle around his computer, log on to the board and chat. Uh, once, and once Allison Hannigan, who played Buffy's friend Willow, posted her number to the site there that they had a fan site, a very early, early edition of a fan site. She was moving to a new apartment. She actually, and someone actually called the old landline and got her. So he was talking this, this goes on to talk about the regular posters would hold an IRL party where Whedon would make an appearance. Brian Bonner, one of the organizers, recalled running into him outside of these events, and Bonner suggested he use the VIP entrance, but Whedon shook his head and said, He said, No, good, I'm good, it's fine. Uh, he calls him always approachable, down-to-earth guy. Allison Beatrice, who wrote a book about Buffy, described the annual gathering as a sort of family reunion. Many found their closest friends to the fan community. And listen, let me tell you something. That happens. Look, the Outlaw Nation, our Discord, our Patreon, quite a few people have found a hell of a community here, have found friends, have gone out to see each other in different states and hang out. They send me pictures. So fandom does breed a sense of friendship, a sense of connection, community, and what have you. And it's always, and I'm always proud that that happens in the Outlaw Nation. I'm sure in some level, Joss was proud of that happening within the Buffy situation as well. Uh, let's see. Fans believe Whedon had found his chosen family too. Behind the scenes of the show, they all loved so much. Uh, but chosen families are not necessarily spared the strife that can plague any family. A Buffy actress who won't, who was nameless here in this interview says, I felt very conflicted with the fans. One Buffy actress told me, I didn't have the same feeling about the show, but I also know sometimes people don't want your truth. 
She believed people hadn't been ready to hear about what Whedon was really like on the set. There was a cult of silence around that sort of behavior. So here's where the uh, the interview starts to turn. And this is really important, too, because what this actress who won't, who is nameless uh, is talking about is people behind the scenes know what's actually going on behind the scenes, actually hear the conversations, actually see the uh, actions of the people involved, hear about some of the terrible thing, witness some of the comments or some of the behavior of people behind the scenes in any entertainment situation. The fans only see what they present to you on screen, what they present to you in a junket because they're trying to sell the show or the TV or the movie. Uh, you only see that. But behind the scenes, there can be something more. And certainly at that time, that culture of speaking out against a showrunner, speaking out against an executive producer, certainly speaking out against someone as powerful as Joss Weed was at that time is a daunting task for any actor or actress to take on or any person involved in a production to take on. Because yes, Hollywood certainly fucking enjoyed blacklisting people who spoke out against this kind of stuff. So it would be no surprise to find out that there were people who didn't want to speak out because they were afraid. So here we go. Whedon was 31 when he was running Buffy. He'd never run a show before. And he was talking about how some some anecdote about holding doors and whatever, hitting his head on the door because so he'd gotten used to someone opening door for him. Uh, he's described by one actor as a huge pulsating brain, uh, that there were thousands of things he was turning to in every moment. He could make the slightest adjustment. Um, and the scene would go from a three to a ten. A sort of cult of personality formed around Whedon, says Lila here in the uh, article. They would hold Shakespeare readings in the amphitheater that Cole, an architect, had built in their backyard. It was like being part of this little family, said an actress. Uh, one Buffy writer recalled Whedon signing posters for every member of the writing staff, uh, and they stood, around, they stood around as he bestowed each of them with personalized words of wisdom like a guru on the hill. The standard reaction to Joss was worship, said one writer. Now, you're 31 years old. I mean, at 31 years old, I don't know many people in Hollywood who are that very well adjusted at 31 years old when they've been handed the keys to the kingdom. They're running multi, they're running a show. They're getting all this love, all this fandom. They're successful. There's money coming in. It can go to anybody's head at 31 years old. Let me tell you, there's not a level-headed 31-year-old out there in Hollywood or not in Hollywood. So you can understand the pressure and this desire, especially for someone who seems to come off as pretty damaged from his childhood probably insecure self-esteem issues. You can understand self-worth issues, him enjoying the adulation. Yes, having the occasional moments of humility where he wants to walk through the front door and out of VIP entrance doesn't discount the fact that he does like to be feted. He does like to be seen as some kind of guru here. And to be fair, Hollywood creates that. And people are complicit in creating these gurus, right? People seek gurus. People seek leaders and other times people who are very level-headed or have a good emotional makeup um resist that kind of stuff but maybe partake in it so they can keep their jobs and do whatever it's not easy look breaking free from someone who has a cult-like approach to being in charge of a situation or being in charge of anything a project a tv show a movie whatever it involved in entertainment it's not easy to break the chains because you start to feel like you have a responsibility, you have a connection, you owe that person, and that becomes um, something that that person who is the guru of that situation takes advantage of either consciously or subconsciously because they need to still feel like they're in power. So it can be quite corrosive, ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you that right now. Uh, all right, let's move on. Uh, Whedon told her not to go. Oh, yeah. Now, here we go to um, Whedon told people, even people who didn't worship him told me working with him could be a wonderful experience. Miracle Lowry, an actress on Whedon's 2009 series Dollhouse, was a size 12 when she got the job. Whedon told her not to go on a diet. He was trying to show that a size 12 woman is normal, sexy, beautiful, and strong. I still get people coming up to me saying how much it meant to them. I felt celebrated by him. And she says, looking back, I saw his kindness and his good intentions, but then I also saw the snarkiness, the fickleness, where I would want to not, where I want to not, I would, where I would not want to be on the other side. Buffy costume designer Cynthia Bergstrom uh, says the article here recalled an incident that happened during se season five. When one episode, Spike asks a sadistic science nerd to create a sex robot of the a version of the Slayer of Buffy. Whedon and Sarah Michelle Gellar did not agree on what Buffy the Buffy bot should wear. Sarah was adamant about being a certain way. The costume she wanted was a bit grandma-ish, a pleated skirt, high neck. He definitely wanted it to be sexier. On the day, Gellar tried the different options. Whedon grew frustrated. 
I was like, Joss, let's just get her dressed, Bergstrom recalled. And here's, this is an interesting point because it's going to come back later. She says, he grabbed my arm. That's a physical attack. Dug in his fingers until his fingernails imprinted the skin. And I said, you're hurting me. At no point should that ever happen on a production. I don't care if you're the fucking top dude or you're the PA or you're the runner. I don't care what it is, but grabbing a woman and imprinting your fingernails on her arm, that's not something that you should be doing uh, in any situation, let alone a production. But we're specifically talking about this woman's memory on a production. Uh, a Firefly re writer remembered him belittling colleague for writing a script that wasn't up to par. And instead of giving her notes privately, he called a meeting with the entire writing staff. It was basically 90 minutes of vicious mockery. Josh pretended to have a slide projector and he read her dialogue out loud and pretended he was giving a lecture on terrible writing as he went through the slides and made funny voices. And the guys were looking down at their pages and, and funny for him, the guys were looking down at their pages and this woman was fighting tears the entire time. I've had my share of shitty showrunners, but the intent to hurt, that's the thing that stands out for me now. And I'm sure Joss is not an anomaly with showrunners in Hollywood at that time. Maybe even now, some of them, even now, maybe... I've heard so many stories from friends of mine who are in the industry and the business of dealing with really shitty showrunners who have no problem embarrassing you in a way to try to get you to supposedly do your best work. And that's what can be quite corrosive about the Hollywood culture once you get behind the scenes. Um, there's a lot of egos, self-esteem issues, a lot of problems going on. And listen, that probably this probably happened, this happens probably in every business, right? In every thing. But you know, you're supposed you're putting out these messages in these movies about accepting people for being different, about being patient with people, about wanting to work together, about these messages that we should all live together as equals. But yet behind the scenes, you're putting people through um, things like this. And that's not a good thing. A high level member of the Buffy production team recalled that Whedon's habit of writing really nasty notes, but that wasn't what disturbed her most about working with him. Whedon, Whedon was rumored to be having affairs with two young actresses on the show too young actresses one day he and one of the actresses came into her office while she was working she says she heard a noise behind her they were rolling around on the floor making out they would bang into my chair how can you concentrate it was gross she said this happened more than once these actions proved he had no respect for me and my work and she quit the show even though she had no other job lined up then there were the alleged incidents with two buffy actresses who wrote that were written about social media. I mentioned that earlier, the Michelle Trachtenberg situation who played Buffy's younger sister claimed there had been a rule forbidden Whedon from being alone with her on the set in a room on, with her on the set. Whedon told me, told uh, Lila, Whedon told Lila, he had no idea what she was talking about. So that's a denial. That's a flat denial that he has no idea what Michelle Trachtenberg was referencing. And Trachtenberg did not want to elaborate. According to this article, one person who worked closely with her on Buffy told me an informal rule did exist Though it was possible Whedon was not aware of it during the seventh season when Trachtenberg was 16, Whedon called her into his office for a closed door meeting. The person does not know what happened, but recalled that Trachtenberg was, quote, shaken afterwards. An adult in Trachtenberg's circle created the rule in response. So, first of all, shout out to Michelle Trachtenberg's circle, who immediately sensed that something was wrong here and put that rule in motion. And second, what could have possibly happened? What are you saying to a 16-year-old? And look, I know 16-year-olds can get frustrating. I get it. I'm not trying to live in some fantasy land. I know they can get frustrating. Certainly, maybe actresses or actors who, who have a little bit of power in Hollywood are getting some fame, getting some attention. But by the same token, your job is to swallow your pride a little bit and navigate the situation so you can get the best performance out of your actress. An actress shouldn't be leaving your trailer who is 16 years old, underage, shaken. That should not be happening uh, for any shape, any reason that's related to your treatment of her, for God's sakes. Um, all right, so the, the and then the, here's the uh, we go into the charisma carpenter stuff. The actress has been talking about it with fans and reporters for a while, for more than a decade. Uh, she says the tensions with Whedon developed well before her pregnancy. She suffered from extreme anxiety, struggled to hit her marks and memorize her lines. Whedon, who is obsessed with word perfect dialogue, was not always patient. After she moved over to Angel, she got a tattoo of a rosary on her wrist, even though her character was working for a vampire, a creature repelled by crosses. Now. I don't know what happened here. I don't think we can speculate too much on what happened here. Did she get the tattoo for herself? Did she get the tattoo to kind of rebel against Joss? Uh, did she not tell the production? I mean, I know even as a, an actor uh, working on a small production in a community theater, if you get you, before you get your haircut, you've got to ask the director, can I get my haircut? You can't just change your hair color, change whatever without getting 
permission, right? It's just kind of how it works because it can affect the overall look of a show. Uh, so another time she chopped off her hair, long hair in the middle of filming of an episode. In her Twitter post, Carpenter seemed to blame Whedon for a performance problem. She wrote that his cruelty intensified her anxiety. She got the tattoo, she explained, to help her feel spiritually grounded and evolved to a work environment. I can certainly understand that. If it's a toxic work environment, you're going to do what you can to do to survive. People do strange things. People do interesting things to survive in toxic work environments. And she certainly was sticking around for quite some time to make sure that she could still, you know, pay the bills, feed, pay, support her life and whatever. So you can understand that. And she wants to be successful. She wants a shot. This is a good show for her. So you get that, but she's going to rebel in certain ways against the situation. And maybe the chopping of the hair, maybe the tattoo is that. Of course, I don't know. Chris McCartney I'm just speculating. Maybe that was her way of pushing back at uh, the control that Joss was wielding over people on the sets. Now, here's where Whedon says he, he acknowledges that he was not, quote, civilized. He said, I was young. I yelled in some, and he said, I yelled. And sometimes you had to yell. This was a very young cast. It was easy for everything to turn into a cocktail party. Now, think about what you just saw with Mike Nichols. I'm going to take a, sorry, Mike Newell um, and Chris Columbus. Look at the description. If you watch the Harry Potter 20th anniversary, Chris Columbus is uh, experienced with working with young actors when I think he was around the same age when he made the Harry Potter, maybe around the same age as, as Joss. I'm not sure, but Joss, of course, not being, I don't know if he was married and had kids at the time, but either way you see the, the relationship he has. Chris Columbus does with the actors. There's such a joy. There's such a, uh, um, a respect and he knows how to connect with them. He knows how to work with them. Nobody uh, said in that interview and in, in that, that he yelled at them, that he went after them, blah, 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 nothing like that. None of that. It was a young uh, director, and he still was able to make connections with the actors. You look at Mike Newell, Mike Newell's situation, getting down and actually physically uh, wrestling one of the uh, Weasley brothers there, which is something an older man should not be doing with a younger male actor, and then um, and then doing all the histrionics and then jumping up and down, so much so that Emma Watson and Rupert Grant were considering leaving the franchise. Uh, and she, apparently, there was some discussions afterwards and mike newell was gone so these are the differences here you got to know how to interact with the younger people if you're going to cast these younger people in the show hell if you don't want to do the fucking show don't do the fucking show anymore if you can't handle working with these teenagers what yelling them and turning them into shit and turning them into basket cases uh and and messing with their heads then you shouldn't be in charge of a fucking show you're clearly not qualified to be in charge of a fucking show i don't care what the results are who gives a shit if you create a fantastic show if you're messing up people behind the scenes who cares it doesn't make sense um he said he would never intend but he does claim that he would never intentionally humiliate anybody he said if i'm upsetting somebody it will be a problem for me sorry the costume designer who said he grabbed her arm he says i don't believe that i just mentioned that a few seconds or a couple minutes ago he said i know i would get angry but i was never physical with people and he was asked did he make out with an actress on the floor of someone's office he says that seems false <laughs> That's not a yes or no. That's a, that seems false. I don't understand that story even a little bit. That is a lot of director speak around what actually might've happened here. And I find that to be fascinating. I mean, that might be false. Uh, this is really interesting to hear that because it's like, what does that mean that that might be false? It doesn't say, he's not saying yes or no. He's saying that seems false. I don't understand that story even a little bit. What, what does that mean? You can say I would never grab someone and hurt them, or, or no, I never did that. He, or oh, sorry, you can never say, say I, I never made out with anybody and rolled into a chair. I never got down and dirty with anybody in front of anybody. He's saying that seems false. I don't understand that story even a little bit. That's such an odd thing to say. Right? Seems exactly level two. Seems it's really weird. Um, it's yeah, exactly. DK says it's weird to say. He doesn't believe in accusation against him and not, I never did that. Exactly. That seems wrong. And it seems like he's covering himself big time uh, in this situation. All right, let's move on here. He says he removed his glasses, rubbed his face. And then he says, I should run to the loo. So he's heading back to the bathroom. When he came back, uh, this, uh, the uh, uh, interview goes on to say, he said the story didn't make sense to him because, quote, he lived in terror 
of his affairs being discovered. So you're telling me you're going to be cocky. You're going to yell at kids, the teenagers. You're going to swagger around the set. You're going to love the hero worship, but you're not going to, you know, have affairs right in people's faces because you think you're untouchable. Somehow that's the line. Yeah, I don't believe that at all. I don't think it, that. I don't think. I think. I think that's absolutely false. And his response to it is absolutely false as well. Um, he says he has. Hum, he, he says she. Uh, the, the article says he had some regrets about how he spoke with Carpenter after learning she was pregnant. I was not mannerly, he said. Still, he was bewildered. This is how the article describes it. Bewildered by her account of their relationship. Quote, most of my experiences with Charisma were delightful and charming. Most of my experiences. Most of my experiences. She struggled sometimes with her lines, but nobody could hit a punchline harder than her. I asked if he had called her fat when she was pregnant. I did not call her fat. Of course I didn't. So there's a flat denial versus that seems false. So this is a flat denial that he did not call her fat. Um, she obviously remembers it differently. So that's a he said, she said situation here. here. But I am I tend to uh, believe Charisma Carpenter. Uh, but he did call another pregnant woman fat, says this uh, article here. Rebecca X, as she's asked to be called, was known as Rebecca Rand Kirshner when she wrote for the last three seasons of Buffy. Since then, she has dropped her, quote, patriarchal last name. She saw Weed in a photo shoot a few years after the show ended when she was weeks away from giving birth. She said, I was happy to see Joss. And the first thing he said to me was, oh, you're fat, she told me. She, this is uh, Lila. She knew he was joking, but didn't find it very funny. Did it hurt me? Yes. Did I say, hey, I got a baby in here? What's your, ex what's your excuse in so many unsaid words? Yes, but I think he was actually slim at this at that point. My point is, it was a dick move, but I wouldn't call it abuse that's fair it's her interpretation of it she was on the receiving end of that comment so for her she can decide if it's abuse to her or not someone on the outside could see it as kind of abusive language abusive behavior for sure but for her she says it was a dick move not abuse uh so and uh lila goes on to say that she took a walk with rebecca x around the huntington botanical gardens near pasadena she wore dark glasses army scarf tied around her gold dark gold hair and spoke with an inflection that called to mind the mid-atlantic accent of an old-fashioned hollywood star that's probably pretty awesome i reached out to her after hearing whedon made her cry in the writer's room here in the months leading up to our meeting she had sent me a series of probing emails excavations of long buried memories once now remember this was a while ago the buffy stuff this was a long time ago you know we're in 2022 ladies and gentlemen buffy was a long time ago once she was in the middle of pitching an idea when whedon placed his hands on the back of her chair keep going he told her as he tilted the chair backward and lowered her to the ground is that a toxic environment she asked me i don't know what is normal behavior and what isn't so i mean this idea of you know, pushing someone to the, I get that you're playing playful. I get, you know, writer's rooms are probably fucking insane. Um, and you know, I'm, there's crazy stuff that happens in those writer's rooms and male men can be quite physically assertive in certain situations when they need to feel power, which is terrible. It's not a good thing. I'm just going to say it clear. It's not a good thing. He takes her chair, yanks her, try, try, tries to scare her, mess with her a little bit, but clearly she was affected. And here's the thing that you need to understand if the person you're doing it to is affected by it, feels abused by it, feels hurt by it, your job is to say, I'm sorry, help me understand why you feel this way. She doesn't even have to answer you, to be honest with you, but you can ask. And even and if she doesn't want to answer you, then your, jo your job is to say, I apologize. I will never do that again. I will do better at, at uh, uh, handling the situation in the future. That's it. It's really not fucking rocket science. I just don't understand why people have such a hard time with doing the really simple things that you can do in certain moments when people are accusing you of certain situations. Just deal with it. If, especially when it's happened, apologize. Promise to do better. Ask if there's anything you can do to make that person feel better about the situation. You've dealt with it, you know? Or go to HR immediately and say, this happened. I need to make you aware of it. I want to address it. Make it, make it happen. All right, she says that she led me down a winding garden path past the terrace of shared delights in the pavilion for washing away thoughts. She alternated between criticizing Whedon, questioning her re reasons for criticizing him and questioning her reasons for questioning those reasons. She said she had once burst into uncontrollable tears after Whedon gave her notes on a script outline, but she couldn't say for sure whether what, this was his fault. Right. I mean, writers can sometimes, and this is no, I'm not trying to say all of them, right? But, but people in entertainment, let's just say that. People in entertainment can have their emotions right there right as raw as possible for whatever reason they're young they're trying to establish themselves they 
they, they're not really good at criticism. There's all kinds of reasons that someone might get emotional. So her saying that she wasn't sure if it was his fault is totally understandable. Um, she says the writer's room was as rowdy as a pirate ship. She and the other writers would spend all day around on chintz couches, making one another laugh while plumbing their most painful memories for story ideas. Well, no thanks. Uh, she says they would fuck with each other and Whedon would fuck with them too, though if you ever fuck with Whedon, he might get mad. Did he approach giving notes in a way that was healthy and consistent with ideals of the endeavor? She wondered, no, he's a blunt instrument, but I'm a very delicate receiver. See, so there's there's a thing where she understands herself that she cannot deal with people who are blunt, that, that are rude, that are offensive, that are not um, respectful in delivery or courteous in delivering um, notes or feedback or what have you. She says, I thought he was a false god. I talked about Joss as if he were a human and people gave me shit for it. Yeah, this is the thing that you have to understand. Once you realize that the cult leader isn't that profound, isn't that smart, isn't that on top of it, and you can break away from the cult leader mentally and emotionally, and essentially showrunners, some showrunners run their writer's rooms like cult leaders running with, with their followers there and wanting to be praised. Because here's the thing with a lot of people who are in positions of power. They love fucking with other people, but they don't like being fucked with. So it's like, well, why the fuck do you get to fuck with other people if your bitch ass can't handle getting fucked with? That's the game. And I've experienced that, that some people in charge of certain things love to mess around with other people's expenses. But when you push back at them, oh boy, do their feelings get hurt. And oh boy, do their ego get a little bruised. And oh boy, do they got to overreact and start a fight. I've seen that right? Sometimes from people I know really well, I've had that interaction or altercation with them uh, and what have you. And so that happens, you know, certain somebody who used to run a certain site hated, hated to get you made fun of him. If you made fun of him, oh boy, you'd get the crabby little bitch baby all day. But if he made fun of you, it was certainly okay for him to do that. Certainly fine for him to do that. You know what? I'm paying your salary so I can fuck with you. Nah, it's not the way it works. All right, so he says, I talked about Joss as if he were a human and people gave me shit for it. She wondered if those who'd been hurt by him had misunderstood him. It's interesting. Whedon has, was not the first boss in the history of moving pictures to make a writer cry. Certainly. The budget was tight. The hours were long. Everyone was exhausted. So can we extend our understanding to, to see that, you know, maybe the time, the amount of exposure, you know, you get, you get mad at your family. You explode at your family if you're on a family trip for too long. Stuff can happen in those writers' rooms, but your job as the runner, as the head executive producer, is to try to be the best version you can be to make sure those rooms don't devolve into something like that. That's why you get paid more than everybody else. That's why you get your ass kissed on interviews and whatever. That's why people write profiles about you, even in 2022 in the New York Magazine, when you haven't done anything of note for quite some time. Even then, it's because people know your name. And so you have a responsibility. Too many people forget that, like, once you achieve a certain level, you have a responsibility. With great power comes great responsibility. I don't know if anybody's ever told people that, but with great power comes great responsibility. She says, Joss is a layered and complex communicator. One time, a long time collaborator told me his tone is deflecting. It's funny. It's got wordplay, rhyme, quote marks, some mumble, self-deprecation, a comic book illusion, a Sondheim illusion. In some words, they only use in England. This means you, the recipient, have to do some decoding. You have to decide if there's a message in there that was meant to correct you, sting you, rib you affectionately, or shyly praise you. So it seems like that's the, you're navigating an unusual person's uh, ability to communicate so misunderstandings can happen um but also intentional hurt can happen you know uh she says uh, uh, rebecca went on to say in emails here to lila can a person have many bad parts eat another person they encounter only experience the good parts can we miss the bad parts of people i know we can't did i joss was a dweeb and joss was sharp as hell and joss was a dick but to me he wasn't a toxic dick he was the kind of dick a person is on is a she was he was the kind of dick a person is on the path to becoming someone better i did believe that and a few days later apparently she emailed her emailed lila and said joss is a beautiful person but you know what i'm actually particularly vulnerable to abusive people Whew, that is a lot to consume to accept to gauge um this is madness to be honest with you exactly level two gets it we bust each other's balls but we both know that it's all in good for sure. Level two trading thinks he's on my level, but he's way, way down here. But I still humor him with a little ball busting just to make sure. 
Um, Alana Hame is sort of friends with PTA, sort of like how Johansson was fine working with Joss, so they make their choices. I guess so, Anthony. It's a good point. Uh, I guess Weed and Defend is what I'm trying to is damage control. Yes, it's trying to be damage control, but it doesn't feel like it's the smart uh, damage control. Back to 1960 says, uh, Weed really thought this was damage control. How arrogant and clueless can you be to think this is trying to positively influence your public perception? Uh, so yeah, a lot of people saying it was better off saying nothing. So uh, valid points there. All right, we're hour in. I'm going to jump into the second half of the interview here, but then I'm going to be done here in a little bit. So if you want to send some support for what I'm doing, going through this interview step-by-step, beat-by-beat with you all, this fantastic uh, interview here, uh, I would love any support you can send through Streamlabs or Super Chats. Any support you can send to Streamlabs address is right there on the screen. It's pinned in the chat. It's in the description of this video. Send some love to the things that I'm doing here and show how much you appreciate the things that we're doing Janine says, uh, Janine makes a valid point here. So with all this drama on the Buffy set, how did he get the Avengers gig? This is a great point you bring up, Janine. And we're going to get to the Avengers stuff and the uh, Justice League stuff in just a second here. But this is a valid point. But it, and, and But what I say to you in response to your question is, think about the time, right? Remember, this is a patriarchal society. This is before Me Too. This is before Black Lives Matter. So these are dudes. And these are dudes, and there's a lot of dudes in Hollywood in positions of power who, when they hear a woman complaining about something or a person of color complaining about something, their immediate response is to not believe them. And the other response is to say they should be grateful they were even on a set. They should be grateful that I even cast them. They should be grateful that they were even here. So maybe these people in Marvel didn't do their job in fully vetting the situation. It wasn't, uh, what's his face? Who am I thinking? Isn't Ike, wasn't Ike in charge of the situation here? Doesn't he get so much shit that things were run really terribly when he was there? There was a lot of racism or there was a, there was an essence of, there was some people, there was a, this idea that women and people of color uh, were not, and, and gay storylines, LGBTQ uh, trans storylines were not to be touched while he was there at Marvel is an Ike Perlmutter. Is that right? Is that right? When he was there at that time. So maybe that's how he got a Janine because someone like Ike there had no problem with it because that person certainly had had an issue with women, issue with people of color, an issue with the LGBT, LGBTQ trans community. So that's a possibility as well. So, um, uh, but it's a great question you asked Janine. So let's get into it. The second I have here. And I appreciate 279 of you watching me live right now. Thank you very much. Please make sure you hit that uh, subscribe button and hit that bell button for God's sakes. Also, I want to give some love to my brother, Michael Vogel, for this T-shirt he got me for Christmas. Trust a bro. Trust a bro moving company. Little Hawkeye shirt there. Thank you very much, Michael Vogel, one of my geek, one of my fellow geek buddies there. Uh, and I wore it today. Give me a little bit of strength as we go through all this. All right. Let's get into the second half of this interview here. Let me move over to my um, safari. On the second day of interviews, I asked Whedon about his affairs. On the set of Buffy, he looked worse than he had the day before. His eyes were faintly bloodshot. He hadn't slept well. He says, I feel fucking terrible about the affairs. He said, uh, quote, it messes up the power, di power dynamic. But then, according to Lila, he doesn't expand on that thought. Instead, he quickly added that he felt that he had to sleep with him, that he was powerless to resist. She laughs, Lila. I'm not actually joking, he said. He said he had been surrounded by beautiful young women, the sort of women who ignored him when he was younger. And he feared if he didn't have sex with them, he would, quote, always regret it. Looking back, he feels shame and, quote, horror. I thought of something he had told me earlier, says Lila, a vampire he'd said is the, quote, exalted outsider, a creature that feels like less than everybody else and also kind of more than everybody else. There's this insecurity and arrogance. They do a little dance. Now, he's reframing this whole situation, right? That he had been surrounded by these beautiful young women who had not given the time of day. But earlier in the interview, he says that he realized that he could attract women with his angstiness, with his kind of artistry, with his uh, you know approach to the world, his more sensitive, vulnerable approach to the world. Now, all of a sudden, he's saying, um, I was in a situation where I could sleep with women who didn't sleep with me before. So basically, he sees it as he was a kid in a candy store and that he could and he would regret it if he didn't have some of the candy which is a terrible objectification of women, right? This is a terrible approach of what he's essentially saying, you know, that he's working out his issues of his insecurity by opening the door to having sex with these young women 
when he's a showrunner and he's in a position of power, right? This is not a good thing. He's in a position of power. And so although he says, looking back, he does feel shame and horror about it all. He does still explain it away saying that, you know, he had an insecurity and arrogance and he thought he would always regret it. If he didn't. So, you know, you, you, you couple that with what he said to or what he quoted about his ex-wife or what his ex-wife said that he felt this desire. There was a disease that he had to have these women, these young women. They were hungry for him, you know, just interesting. Uh, Buffy ended in 2003, but his affairs did not. He slept with employees. He slept with fans. That's kind of crazy. And colleagues, eventually his wife found out in 2012, they split up in Cole's open letters to fans. She accused him of using feminism as a cover for his infidelities. He always had a lot of female friends, but he told me it was because his mother raised him as a feminist. So he just liked women better. But after learning she, he had been deceiving her for 15 years, she was diagnosed with complex PTSD, the same condition as him. I want the people to worship him to know he is human. She says, and there's a picture there of him. Uh, and his and Kai uh, there in 2001. So um, Lila goes on to say that she spoke with three women who dated Whedon after his marriage ended in their stories. He was not the hero they had read about in the press, the one who wanted to see women in control. He was more like the cold-blooded man he depicted in his work. Now, whatever issues he was working out, certainly from the divorce, let me tell you something. I've dated someone after a divorce. It is a fucking, it was a, the most horrific relationship of my life. It was terrible. That person was going through a lot of emotional shit. And now in retrospect, it was a completely wrong decision to get with someone who was working out their issues on you. And you were, you know, you were, I was also in this relationship for five years, clearly working out my issues of rejection and acceptance and love and non-love and all of that with this. So I get, so being involved with someone after a divorce can be a dangerous minefield of a situation emotionally, just being real here, just being, I'm not explaining anything away. I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, legitimize anything you did. I'm just saying it can be quite a minefield if you're dealing with someone who is still navigating their insecurities and their self-esteem issues. It says, um, uh, Sarah, a student met Whedon when he was promoting age of Ultron. She was 22 a 22-year-old freelance writer who interviewed him for a pop culture website. Now, I don't know who this is. I don't know if this person is still writing. I don't know who this is. And I certainly won't speculate on this person in case this is someone that I've met before, someone that I've come in contact with before, someone that I've run into before, someone who might follow me as a writer. I don't know. So I don't. I want to make sure that's clear. I'm not speculating on this person's whatever is going on here. But yeah, this is Sarah, 22-year-old freelance writer who interviewed him for a pop culture website. After the piece published, they began a sexual relationship. He led me to believe he was single, she said. One night she went out for drinks alone with a friend that Whedon had wanted her to meet. So this, Whedon has set this meeting up. After the friend mentioned she had a long-term boyfriend, Sarah asked what his name was. She says, I'm dating Joss Whedon. The woman replied. When Sarah was already dating Joss Whedon. So essentially, Joss set Sarah up to meet another woman who was also dating Joss when Sarah didn't know she was dating Joss. That is a colossal mind fuck to do to someone, especially when they're 22 years old. And that's a horrible power play, a horrible power play, especially when you're like fucking Joss Whedon and she's a freelance writer and young, you know. Um, Sarah went into the bathroom and threw up. What the fuck is he playing at? She remembers thinking. Then uh, Lila goes on to talk about Aaron Shade, a television writer who moonlights as a psychic medium who got involved with Whedon in 2003 while working as a showrunner's assistant on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., a series he created with one of his younger half-brothers and the brother's wife. He was 49. She was 23 and a virgin. One day, Whedon texted her with an unusual request. Would she come over to his house for the weekend to watch him write? He would pay her $2,500 more than Shade made a month as an assistant. She had to hide it from her bosses. That was the caveat. They dated on and off in secret for nearly a year before she slept with him. For a year before she slept with him. Not long after, he sent her a brief email telling her he couldn't have a girlfriend. This was after they slept together. He finally got her in bed. She was a virgin. Got her in bed. And then shortly afterwards, sent a brief email uh, telling her he couldn't have a girlfriend. Seven years later, she made a 10-hour YouTube series called Aaron the Snake Whisperer that chronicled the painful consequences of the relationship. I got to watch this. I haven't seen this. I don't know if you guys have seen this. I got to watch this. She's surrounded by candles and crystals. She described their relationship as an abuse of power. People like Joss offset the trauma on other people in exchange for their energy and take their energy to keep going, keep themselves alive almost. That's why he's so good at the vampire narrative. Whedon only responds that he should have handled the situation better. 
Um, when Arden Lee met Whedon in 2012, she was a sex educator in her 20s. All three of these women in their 20s, when he's like almost 50, for God's sakes. The author of The New Rules of Attraction, a book about being a female pickup artist, she picked him up at a club. After the second date, Whedon sent her DVDs of Dollhouse, the heroine played by Buffy, uh, alum Eliza Dushku, has no friends, no family, no personality. Essentially, she gets into a relationship with Joss where it's an owner and doll relationship. She said for the most part, she found it gratifying, and she believed he did too. Uh, Whedon told me he identified with the character in Dollhouse um, and Topher, the nerdy scientist who imprints the dolls with their personalities. It's not a flattering comparison. As one of Topher's colleagues points out, he was picked to work at the Dollhouse because he had no morals. You had always thought of people as playthings. This is not a judgment. You always took take good care of your toys. And he doesn't, though, because Topher, in the end, according to Lee, neither did Whedon. Bad dolls are banished to the attic, a room where they are forced to relive their worst nightmares over and over. She says in 2015, hours before her birthday, after she had told her that uh, one of the most traumatic relationship uh, uh, memories of her past in dating situations was being broken up with on her birthday, he did that to her in 2015. Hours before her birthday, he came over to her house and told her their relationship was over. If he was like, what could I do to Arden that would be her worst nightmare? That would have been it. Josh destroyed a beautiful thing just to show he had the power to do it. That's literally everything you need to know about it. Patterns here that are developing, I think, are really impossible to ignore, right? This is fascinating. Then uh, Lila goes on to talk about Richard III and how um, Joss had seen Mark Rylance play Richard III um, and he identified with the character who's devoid of empathy, but in one of the play's final scenes, he awakens tormented by fear. And in the play, Richard III sleeps with these women and tosses them away as soon as he's done with them um, and murders them when he has no use for them. So he feels that he's connected to that. Um, oh my God. It says he identifies with this character. It's kind of crazy. Anyway, so he's just directed, Mar uh, Whedon's experience with Seamus III coincided with his own coronation of a kind. He just directed Marvel's Avengers, a commercial juggernaut. GQ hailed Whedon as the quote, most inventive pop storyteller of his generation. He had in influenced a generation of TV creators, delighted in quirky language. You could observe these hallmarks reflected in uh, Veronica Mars, Battlestar Galactica, and Lost. Um, but as the culture around him continued to change, certain fans began to see Whedon through a more critical lens, discerning an attitude toward women that seemed unenlightened by the standards of the female-centered shows and movies his success had, in some cases, helped to spawn. In 2007, the same year Cole published her letter, an old old Wonder Woman screenplay he had written serviced online, compared with Wonder Woman's Patty Je movie Patty Jenkins had recently directed his version, struck some readers as creepy and sexist, as I mentioned earlier, with passages that seemed to linger gratuitously on the Amazon sex appeal. One woman tweeted, you cannot tell me Joss Whedon didn't write the original Wonder Woman script while furiously cranking his hog. That year, Whedon took a job doing rewrites for the Warner Brothers film Justice League, a DC property directed by Zack Snyder, for two white men in their 50s making comic book flicks. He and Snyder could hardly have been less creatively or philosophically aligned while Whedon's superhero epics were le leavened by irony and wordplay, Snyder's were brooding and self-important with a visual style that combined the artificiality of a video game with the fascist aesthetic of a, of a Lenny Riefenstahl production. Now, I don't agree with Lila's assessment here. This is the standard criticism of Zack Snyder. I think there's more that's going on here, and you won't find anybody accusing Zack Snyder of the inappropriate behavior Joss Whedon has apparently been practicing for decades in this business. So... um, Steiner's fans were every bit as ardent as Whedon's. Just going to talk about more about the, the smashing of between both of them, uh, those fans. Um, uh, they said, uh, so um, Whedon's, okay, they, goes in to talk about how Batman v Superman had faulted the box office and offended critics with A.O. Scott going so far, the critic A.O. Scott going so far as to assert that Snyder and his corporate backers, quote, had no evident motive to produce such a joyless spectacle of power beyond their own aggrandizement. Now those backers were concerned and early screening did not reassure them. We all know this. You know, they asked me to fix it, says Whedon, and I thought I could help. He now says this decision was the worst decision and one of the biggest regrets of his life. He claims they first told him that ex the WB executives first told him that he would just be writing and advising. And that was what was released. And that was what we talked about. I think I remember us talking about that on Movie Talk. But soon it became clear that Whedon had lost faith in Snyder's vision and wanted him to take full control. A, wep, a rep for Warner Brothers denies this. Of course, they always deny this crap. Snyder has publicly said he left the project to spend time with his family. His daughter had died by suicide two months earlier. 
Whedon was now installed in the director's chair. Here we go. Overseeing, overseeing nearly 40 days of reshoot from the start. Things were tense between him and his stars. It wasn't just that he wanted to impose a whole new vision. He introduced an, an entirely different style of management. Snyder had given the actors exceptional license with the script, encouraging them to ad-lib dialogue. Whedon expected them to say their lines exactly as he had written them during his reshoots. Now, I have a friend who knows Kieran Hines. She works in production. She is someone who I implicitly trust. Um, and she told me that they had done like three levels of reshoots for Justice League off Joss Whedon's writing. And this act, Kieran said, oh, and this is through her. So I'm not saying that Kieran, I'm, I'm not officially quoting Kieran, but she said that Kieran told her that every time he came back to redo the lines, they got worse and worse every time. So that didn't go down well at all, says one crew member um, about uh, them wanting to ad lib. Some critic some actors criticized his writing. Right here we go. The 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 guy giving everybody shit who can't take shit now is taking shit from these actors who are criticizing his writing. By Whedon's account, Gal Gadot, who played Wonder Woman, suggests that he, the director of the highest grossing superhero movie at the time, didn't understand how superhero movies work. Now, imagine this. Imagine someone like Gal Gadot, who had not been a lead necessarily in any film other than Wonder Woman at the point at that time. She's certainly embracing her power, but she's a woman who has established herself in her life, you know, in Israel, and whatever you feel about her political points of views and things she said, that's that's neither here nor there. This is a steely woman who has worked her way into this position. Now, here's a woman of power who is telling Joss Whedon, hey, the things you're writing aren't working. I don't think you understand superhero movies. And maybe that's a moment to be like, all right, let me take a step back. Let's go into a room. Let's talk about this. What am I not understanding here that you think I could do better? That isn't what he said. That isn't what he did. At one point, Whedon paused the shoot and according to the crew member announced that he had never worked with, quote, a ruder group of people. He said that to the actors and to the production. And according to her, Lila, the actors fell silent. The actors at least felt uh, Whedon had been rude too. Ray Fisher, a young black actor, played Cyborg. It was his first major role. Snyder had sent to the film on his character. Now, how do you say, oh, let me stop for a second. How do you tell these established actors they're the rude ones because they won't say your dialogue the way you wanted to say it? An interactive process. It's only ego that allows people to not participate in an inter interactive progress, uh, a process rather. It's ego that's gone overboard. Interactive is so important. Being interactive is, is how you get the best work, right? It doesn't mean you have to take all the ideas that another person comes up with. What it is that you take the best idea in the room, the idea that works the best for you. And if you're not having the best ideas and you're the showrunner, get to fucking work and start coming up with better ideas. That's how it works. That's an interactive process. And everyone feels ownership in an interactive process. Whenever I've managed... I've always tried to make an interactive process in the management. I like to make it, even when I do these shows with my co-hosts, I always like to say, hey, what do you think works? What do you want to do? What feels comfortable to you? Like, I like to make it feel as if we're all in on this because it allows people to invest more into the situation. Telling your actors, who, by the way, who had gotten used to Zack Snyder, who worked with Zack Snyder, who got a process here, instead of adjusting your process, you're making them completely do a sea change and then you're calling them rude. I think that's a massive mistake. It's no different than in sports when a coach comes in and takes over players halfway through the season then absolutely turns uh, into a dictator and it frustrates the the uh, the um, locker room. And nine times out of ten, that coach is gone by the end of the season or by, the begin uh, by sometime during the next season because the players tune out. The players aren't going to give you that extra 10% that makes the difference between winning and losing when they don't want to win or lose for you. Just putting it out there. Anyway, let's get to the Ray Fisher situation. Ray Fisher, a young black actor, played Cyborg. It was his first major role. Snyder had centered the film on his character, the first black superhero in a DC movie, and he treated Fisher as a writing partner, soliciting his opinions on the film's representations of black people. We downsized Cyborg's role. Now, listen to that. Fisher had treated... I mean, uh, Snyder had treated Fisher as a writing partner, soliciting his opinions on the film's representations of black people. For whatever you give Snyder, you give shit. Snyder understood. I don't know the black experience. You know the black experience. I've cast you in this role. 
Let's work together to deliver an authentic black experience. Right? Here comes Joss Whedon who says, fuck that. I'm going to cut your role, cut your scenes. Um, and the scenes that I'm cutting are the ones that challenge the stereotypes of black young men, of black actors, of black characters in films. The worst thing you can be to Hollywood is an intelligent person of color. Because sure as fuck do they hate that. Because you're, make, you're challenging all their foundation that they have built up through their lives in believing. You know? Sometimes these are white guys who are still doing rap lyrics using the N-word freely, uh, you know, behind the scenes or saying certain things in certain ways behind the scenes. And so that's the thing. You come in and you challenge that. And it sounds like Ray Fisher did that. When Fisher raised his concerns about the revisions in a phone call, Whedon cut him off and says, it feels like I'm taking notes right now. See, again, the ego, that is the ego. Who the fuck are you, you young black punk kid, to come and tell me a successful, white, bloated, insecure, with low self-esteem guy how to do my job? Who are you that I need to take notes from? Rather than, okay, this might be some constructive criticism. Let me listen to an experience that I have never had, you know, let me listen to another person to hear what they have to say. No, it's like, I'm taking notes from you now, dude, that's all ego. That's insecurity. That's low self-esteem. That's no matter what you accomplish still at the bottom of, and the foundation of who you are, you don't believe in yourself and you don't believe that you're worth any of the praise. Whedon told him, according to the Hollywood Reporter, and I don't like taking notes from anybody, not even Robert Downey Jr. So invoking the holy name of Robert Downey Jr., please. RDJ is great. And RDJ has accomplished a lot. But don't forget that RDJ had his own problems as well. So this idea that he's the venerated, come on, it's ridiculous. Gaudo didn't care for Whedon's style either. Last year, she told reporters Whedon threatened her, quote unquote, and said he would, quote, make her career miserable. Whedon told me he did no such thing. So he's denying this. He says he never did this with Gal. He said, I don't threaten people. Who does that? He concluded, and he concluded that she had misunderstood him. And here is the fucking point. English is not her first language, and I tend to be annoyingly flowery in my speech. I mean, just take a moment to think about the stupidity of saying something like that in 2022. This is supposed to be your damage control interview, and you tell the reporter that the Israeli actress who has been successful, has been in numerous films speaking English before you saw her, somehow misunderstood you. I find that to be insulting, offensive, racist, xenophobic. It's just such a dumb fucking thing to say. And then to cover it up by saying, I tend to be annoying flowery in my speech. So in essence, he's trying to be self-deprecating while kissing his own ass, but also um, taking Gal Gadot down a peg or trying to take it at Gal Gadot down a peg by, by insinuating that she didn't understand him. Now, I'm not saying misunderstandings can't happen sometimes, but she didn't just come off the boat and arrive in America the day before the Justice League reshoots. Give me a fucking break. It's such an insulting thing to say. He recalled arguing over a scene she wanted to cut. He told her jokingly that if she wanted to get rid of it, she would have to tie him to a railroad track and do it over his dead body. Then I was told that I had said something about her dead body and tying her to the railroad track. Gadot did not agree with Whedon's version of events. I understood perfectly, she told New York Magazine in an email. The New York Magazine is the one who did this uh, interview here with Vulture. As for Whedon's claim that he doesn't threaten people, an actress on Angel told me that he had that, that hadn't been true back even when she knew him on Angel. After her agent pushed for her to get a raise, she claims Whedon called her at home and said, quote, she was never going to work for him or 20th Century Fox again. Reading Gadot's quote, she thought, wow, he's still using that line. Whedon officially denied that as well for this interview. Justice League premiered. Snyder's fans blamed Whedon for its failures, accusing him, as one tweet put it, of turning Snyder's godlike heroes into a clown. The power of fandom forced Whedon had done so much, uh, forced Whedon had done so much to cultivate the start of his career was now wielded, wielded against him. The fans launched an elaborate campaign. This just goes on and on about how Snyder uh, and his fan and the fans there uh, essentially um, went after Whedon's cut and forced uh, and pushed and 
got the Snyder cut to be a reality. Uh, around the same time, mid worldwide protests against racism, it's Black Lives Matter situation. Fisher posts a series of tweets accusing Whedon of abusing his power and charging studio executives with, quote, enabling the director. In a Forbes interview, Fisher said he'd been told Whedon had used color correction to change an actor's, an actor of color's complexion because, quote, he didn't like the actor's skin tone. Fisher said, man, with everything 2020 has been, that was the tipping point for me. Now, Fisher did not respond to multiple interview requests or, com- or quotes um, for this article. It says here, uh, Whedon sa- it says here that Whedon was stunned. He'd given the whole movie a lighter look, brightening everything in post-production, including all the faces. He said the claim that he disliked the character's skin tone, which Forbes ultimately retracted, was false and unjust. Whedon says he cut down Cyber's role for- Cyborg's role for two reasons. This is the tough thumb. <coughs> sorry <coughs> sorry i'll be going on for an hour and a half <coughs> holy shit i got 340 40 of you just thank you so much for joining me live please remember to uh hit a like on this video uh and also leave a comment down below if you're watching later let's get in the official thing but ben rayner sent me a super chat he said hey roca thanks for going over this it's very upsetting to hear the truth, but it must be said. Thanks for talking this out with us. Much appreciated. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate the super chat. Ladies and gentlemen, please say it in the stream. Super stream lives with super chat support. I'm, I'm going crazy here, doing an hour and a half going through all this. So I'd love your support. Love any kind of support you can send to the uh, to the outlaw nation here. Dave Drano said, I'm curious why are relationships between coworkers even tolerated in the workplace in Hollywood? It seems if there was a zero tolerance policy. Some, not all issues could be cut off before they even start. David, you make a great point. Unfortunately, it's not the reality of life. You, you know, in any business, you're going to have interactions with coworkers. You're going to have situations with coworkers. That's just life, you know, and uh, sometimes you're not sure of what the uh, parameters are. Sometimes you are sure of what the parameters are and you still violate them anyway. So clearly, and in Hollywood more so because you're stuck on a set, there's emotions that are getting raw, you're exposing yourself to another person emotionally, anything can happen at that point when you get into a relationship like that and things can just kind of launch off from there, you know, and that happens. It happens. Uh, There's no way you're going to make adults who have a zero tolerance policy on a Hollywood set. They couldn't even retract the gun situation after the rust shooting. Now they've kind of turned their backs on the idea of like no guns on the set or anything like that. Now that's done, you know? So even that, even someone getting killed on set from the misuse of a weapon, uh, initially Hollywood reacted with uh, stronger measures or calls for stronger measures. They were uh, going to enact it. And then now all of a sudden they're not going to enact it. So it's just that kind of thing, man, unfortunately. So you hope people can be adults in the situation and navigate the stuff more effectively all right <clears throat> uh let's get into okay so um according to a source familiar with the project whedon wasn't alone in feeling that way oh sorry sorry uh whedon says he cut down cyber's role cyborg's role for two reasons the storyline quote logically made no sense and he felt the acting was bad calling ray fisher in essence a bad actor a untalented actor According to a source familiar with the project, Whedon wasn't alone in feeling that way. At test screenings, viewers deemed Cyborg, quote, the worst of all the characters in the film. Despite that, Whedon insists he spent hours discussing the changes with Fisher and that their conversations were friendly and respectful. None of the claims Fisher made in the media were, quote, according to him, either true or merited discussing. This is the arrogance here. Again, this idea that these accusations don't merit discussion. That's arrogant. If a person of color says to you, hey, I'm not happy with this or is going around talking to people saying, hey, I had an uncomfortable situation or I didn't like what was going on the set. You can put yourself out there. You can reach out to this person behind the scenes. You can find some way to have this interview with this person and talk to them. Now, if they're using the situation and they're lying about it, then, yeah, maybe it's difficult to get a meeting with this person because that person is using it for their own benefit. But I don't see that with Ray. I think Ray actually legitimately went through this experience and he's spoken about it. So for Joss as a white man to say that a young black man's claims are not, don't have, don't merit discussion is fucking offensive and racist and dumb at the bottom line. It's dumb. Whedon told me he could only think of one way to explain Fisher's motives. We're talking about a malevolent force is what he says about, he describes Fisher 
a, this guy who he wouldn't even take notes from, all of a sudden, Ray Fisher is this malevolent force. We're talking about a bad actor in both senses. So essentially calling Ray a liar. That's the coded word. That's what the coded phrase means when you're saying someone's a bad actor, a false flag, a bad actor. You're essentially saying they're lying. They're making stuff up. That's what Joss Whedon is claiming. <clears throat> now, some of Whedon's defenders, there are some of those, I guess, uh, um, claim that what if Fisher had been doing Snyder's bidding without furnishing proof, they speculated that Snyder had tricked Fisher into thinking Whedon was racist or maybe Fisher knew perfectly well his allegations were bullshit. Either way, the actor and the director had, quote, manufactured a controversy that made Snyder seem like a progressive ally while diverting attention from the fact that their early cut had been a disaster. Whedon's advocates believed this campaign had poisoned Carpenter against Whedon. Oh, Jesus Christ. Are these the same people that think there was election fraud? Uh, are these the same QAnon nutballs creating th conspiracy theories out of thin air? Causing her to see the complicated story of their relationship to a sim as a simplistic narrative of abuse. Once someone lights a fuse and people see there's a flame, they run to it and throw stuff into it. One person in Whedon's circle said. Snyder declined to be interviewed for this article. In our conversation, said Lila, Whedon was somewhat circumspect, more circumspect. He said, I don't know who started it. I just know in whose name it was done. Snyder superfans were attacking him online as a bad feminist and a bad husband. They don't give a fuck about feminism, said, said uh, Whedon. I was made a target by my ex-wife and people exploited that cynically. See, so rather than being like, hey, there's a lot of smoke here. I need to take a look at myself. Because he claimed at the beginning of this interview that he was working on himself. Now, later on in this interview, and this is the second day of interviews, he's saying... People exploited it. People, you know, followed my ex-wife and they went after me. So in no way is he doing the work that he needs to be doing if this is his response. As someone who's gone through therapy and had to take a look at my own behavior and apologize for my own behavior and go find the source of my anger and understand where my anger was coming from as a young man in my 20s and 30s when I was doing my therapy and understanding that it was stemmed from a lot of the insecurity and the feelings of my father, who I loved to death, had put in me because he had wanted so much from me and didn't understand how to raise a sensitive kid like I was. I understood that I hated myself because I was split into two parts. There was the angry, uh, macho, Latino John Roca, and there was the sensitive uh, artist John Roca, and the loud machina, uh, macho guy was making fun of the, of the artist all the time in my own mind. And so I hated myself, low self-esteem, low self-worth. And so there's an anger that develops there because you constantly feel attacked by anybody and anything. And so you have to navigate that. And the way to navigate that is not actually to fight back against it in a way that causes you to get angrier. It is to say, okay, I have this. Where does this come from? And when you research and find out where it comes from, most of the time it comes from an incident and then it comes from, which is an inciting incident. And then it comes from a repetitive behavioral pattern from someone of power in your life when you were younger. And unfortunately that was my dad. You know, and so my dad, when he got older and he was dying of cancer and he was more vulnerable and more open to having these conversations of emotions with me, we got to the source of everything. We had a fantastic moment before my father passed of cancer where he apologized for everything. I mean, he held my hand and he said, I'm so sorry for everything I did, for all the mistakes I made, for the times I yelled at you and I should have yelled at you. I should have been a more understanding father. I should have been more of a guide for you in life. And I just messed that up because I didn't know how to do that. I, my father, my father died when I was 10 years old. My stepfather was an alcoholic, abusive stepfather. So I never got the emotional tools of the vocabulary to understand a sensitive, talented, art, artistic son like you. That's what he told me before he died. You know, it was like a week later he died. So we got to have that moment of, hey, this hurt me. All this hurt me. I need to tell you about it. And he listened. He didn't say, oh, you're exploiting my trauma. You're exploiting this or that. Or you're, or you're being cynical. He listened. He heard me. He didn't call me a bad actor. He heard me, my experience. And when I was done and in tears, my proud macho Latino father grabbed my hand and said he was sorry and legitimately meant it. And it was so beautiful. I cried rivers, rivers. You guys thought I cried when I retired at the stage of Smodown? Please, that was fucking, uh, that was like a, a, a stream compared to the amount of rivers I cried when my father apologized for everything. It was beautiful. It was a gift and I'll never forget it. But you've got to go authentically through the therapy and be willing to authentically 
accept your role in it, accept your blame, accept your um, um, terrible behavior stemmed from your insecurity in order to really climb out a better person from therapy. And there's no way I have the lady outlaw if I hadn't climbed to my therapy the way I did. There's no way. You know, both back in in my 30s and then also recently recovering from the suicide uh, that I almost took, uh, almost uh, did in 2016. So those are those things that you understand. So he says, explains his voice sank into a horse whisper. She put out a letter saying some bad things I'd done and saying some untrue things about me, but I had done the bad things so people know knew I was gettable. So turning himself into a victim. Essentially, vic this is the victimization of Joss Whedon here. Everyone's coming after me. Everyone thinks I'm this. Everyone says that. She goes on to talk a little bit more about Snyder's work in 300 uh, and uh, that people had, that are, the UN delegation from Iran had threatened to, in the 300, that the film 300 was so overtly racist in the view of the UN delegation of Iran that it threatened to incite, quote, a clash of civilizations. Now the internet had recast Snyder as a progressive hero while, Brandon, while branding Whedon, its progressive hero of yesterday, as a villain and a bigot. He said, the beginning of the internet raised me up and the modern internet pulled me down. The perfect symmetry is not lost on me. So again, I am the victim. I was created by this thing and now I was destroyed by this thing. I am the tragic hero, the tragic Greek hero of my own tale. It is a self-aggrandizement that it still stems from his self-importance, his self-belief that he is some, somehow worthy of being feted, being carried into town like the twins in the book of Boba Fett. And instead of walking through town like Boba Fett, he wants to be carried like the pompous ass he is. At Whedon's house, his wife Horton would occasionally come into the room bringing tea, chocolates. When I asked where they had met, she said right here that a mutual friend had introduced them in the winter of 2019 after learning that Whedon had bought several of Horton's paintings, including a self-portrait, and she was greeted by an image of herself when she walked into his home. By then, Whedon had begun seeking treatment for sex and love addiction, along with other tendencies like Franco and Kevin Spacey and Harvey Weinstein. Uh, was he using a page out of some crisis management playbook? Whedon says he's genuinely committed to the work. I decided to take control of my life or to try. The first thing I did with Heather was to tell her my patterns, which was not my MO. I couldn't shut up because I finally found somebody I found more important than me. Life was good and also bad. He overcame the isolation and ridiculed a childhood, found himself in the role of social outcast again now. He still had an agent, but it seemed like no one wanted to work with him at Fisher's urging. Warner had conducted a series of investigations in the Just League production. The studio won't disclose its findings, but in late 2020, it announced remedial action had been taken, and then Whedon was removed from Nevers, which a lot of us know about. <clears throat> Over the last year, some of his fans have tried to scrub him out too, erasing him from the narratives about Buffy uh, and about what made Buffy great, claiming that uh, women played a more integral role than was initially um, delivered or initially um they said how can i say this i guess i'll just read what lida wrote here in posts and essays they have download played his role in the show's development pointing out that many people including many women were critically important to its success it may be hard to accept that we could have understood the pain of a character like buffy a woman who endures infidelity attempted rape and endless violence but the belief that her story was something other than a projection of his psyche is ultimately just another fantasy we did understand his pain his own some of that pain as he once put it to me spilled over into the people around him spilled over and some of it was channeled into his art we once wrote a line that could have served as a warning to all of us in firefly one of the crew members jane accidentally tosses the spoils of a botch robbery into the hands of the town's poor jane is not a good man but when he returns to the town years later he sees its residents have erected a statue in his honor when he confides to the crew's captain that he's unsettled by this development the captain just stares into the distance and says it's my estimation that every man ever, ever got a statue made of him was one kind of some bitch or another ain't about you jane it's about what they need Whedon says, nobody ever fell from a pedestal into anything but a pit, he told uh, Lila on a call one day. A few months had passed since our conversations at his house, she says. In that time, he'd finally made peace with himself, and he said, could I have done marriage better? He asked, don't get me started. Could I have done, been a better showrunner? Absolutely. Should I have been nicer? He considered the question. Perhaps he could have been calmer, more direct. But would that not have compromised the work? Ah, Maybe the problem was he'd been too nice, he said. The problem was he'd been too nice. He'd wanted people to love him, which meant when he was direct, people thought he was harsh. In any case, he decided he was done worrying about all that. People had been, quote, using every weaponizable word of the modern era to make it seem like I was an abusive monster. I think I'm one of the nicer showrunners 
that's ever been. And that is the end of the article here Ooh, from Lila, uh, sorry, from, uh, from Vulture and from the interviewer, Lila Shapiro, who you can follow at Lila Pearl on Twitter. So crazy, crazy. Uh, my problem is I'm too nice. Yeah, Ellen DeGeneres said the same thing, and I know from a couple of people who worked on that set, that is absolute horseshit. She was a pretty terrible person to a lot of people. And her head writer um, told you he liked your jokes by spitting chewed gum in your face. So that you don't think you can get away with that unless your overall boss is not also a person who doesn't mind toxic behavior. So pretty unsettling stuff on so many levels uh, to read here. And I, uh, yeah, I don't know. Where am I at right now? Am I, where am I at right now? I always, always forget where my original overlays here is. And so I, to me, I come away from this interview feeling like this was a colossal misstep of PR damage control by him. Just colossal. The defiant king. I mean, this feels Trumpian almost, I would say. Almost Trumpian, you know? They're all coming after me for no reason. I never did anything wrong. Uh, it's, a, it's a witch hunt. It's campaign. It's, it's basically what he's saying. He's basically saying, you know, I love the women people. They love me. I didn't do anything like that to them. And it's all that. It's just that nonsense of someone who's been in power, taken from power because of the behavior they got away with for years. Um, and that other people doing, by the way, and I would encourage articles to go and, and or writers rather than reporters to go and start investigating all these showrunners from the past that we have deified to find out what how they were actually treating their actors and their production and, and people in their production and what have you. You know, this idea of hero worship, it has to die once and for you can respect people's work, respect what they've created, certainly, you know, kind of explore their work and give them love. But this idea of erecting the statues, I hope we're coming to a place where we stop doing that overall, because this is what happens. You know, most people in Hollywood aren't that emotionally well-adjusted. They aren't, you know, therapeutically well-adjusted. Even Josh, we Josh Whedon says at the end of this interview, if he had done this work, maybe if he had taken all their, he, none of the work would have been created. If he had done this work on himself, maybe he wouldn't have been inspired to work. And you know what? I know actors who don't go to therapy because they feel like if they fix what's wrong with them, they won't be able to access the emotions they need in a scene uh, for us, for a scene in a, in a, in a show, in a play, uh, in a, in a, in a class or in a movie. They're afraid that if they work on themselves, they'll lose that creative spark. When in fact, the truth is, once you come to terms with everything and you handle your emotion, you can call on it even quicker with more authenticity than drudging up the old incident that caused you to feel this way. Because what happens is you become out of control. And like he says here at the end of this interview, his trauma, his emotions, his insecurities, his issues spill over onto other people. And those people have to pay the price for his inability to deal with his shit. And that's what you get here. And I really don't like the way he, um, <clears throat> you know, call essentially calls Ray Fisher a liar. Essentially says Ray Fisher's claims are completely erroneous. Gives no validity. Doesn't even bother to give any validity to it. Then claims it was with Gal Gadot. It was a misunderstanding because she does English is not her first language. And then all these other things that she says throughout where he denies almost everything he's done uh, or been accused of rather. And then says that, you know, it just, uh, it just I became someone they came after because my ex-wife wrote this article. And the truth is, if there were a thousand, if there were a bunch of people who were willing to defend him in public and willing to kind of like, and if there were no incidents, I don't think it would have come after. Him. And that's the thing at the end of the day, there's, just, there's too much smoke here, too much smoke here to not think that there's some kind of fire. So. Um, I think it was a complete and utter um, mistake by him. Uh, and I don't know if this is scorched earth. I don't know what this is. Dominic Smith says, I don't think this is damage. I think he knows he's done working, but this is his truth. As scary as that is, he just wanted to finally say his piece. Hopefully we're done with this crazy. Yes, hopefully you are. 
Anna Vasquez says, not just Hollywood, I work in tech in Silicon Valley. Trust me, this kind of egotistical behavior is normal. Oh yeah, trust me, I know. Trust me, I know. In this business that I do now, this egotistical behavior is uh, sometimes normal. Um, I'll say that. That's what I'll say. Uh, I have had conversations, dealt with, um, talked with, had bosses who have this kind of egotistical behavior, who talk shit about other people, but if you talk shit about them, they threaten your job. Um, I had that with a guy who owned a place I used to work at. I had that with a guy who was the editor-in-chief of a place I used to work at. So that's the kind of nonsense you have to deal with this because people's egos are out of control. And people lie to themselves, hey, I work on these progressive causes or I champion these progressive causes. I couldn't possibly be a toxic person to work for. Well, what about all these comments where you're putting down your writers and you're making fun of your writers or you're being defensive or whatever, and then when someone kind of pushes back at you, you immediately threaten their job. That's not fucking toxic? Grow up. That is. And so you look at this situation, and it's the thing, same thing here with uh, Joss. He, ha- he lorded over the entertainment for so long Shit got exposed, and instead of going like, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm going to take a look at myself. I'm going to have conversations with people. I'm going to go and do the damage control for myself that I need to do. I need to go do the actual work that I need to do so I can climb out of this thing and be a better person. And then if a studio is uh, willing to take a chance on me, I will do the work. I will be a better showrunner. I will be a better person. That's the way you do this. This scorched earth thing that he did in this interview was just such a phenomenal mistake. And people are just going to brush it off and brush him off. Uh, And it's a shame. Um, Aaron Fountain says, egos are omnipresent in academia. I know from experience. Oh, I'm sure, Aaron. Academia, oh, there's no place where egos are not, uh, you know, in in quick supply, uh, for sure, or or in big supply, rather. (laughs) <laughs> Avernathi Ross says, now I know Uh No, I left, pal. Nobody removed me. I left. My time was done on that show. Uh, and uh, I knew it was time to go. I read the writing on the walls. Like, I got to get out of here. And I wanted to focus on my channel more. So nobody removed me, guy. But I appreciate you making the joke. Um, All right. Let's see here. All right. Let's see. Uh, Philly G, thank you very much for the donation. I appreciate it. Uh, David, David Dranow says, um, one more time, thinking about Ray Fisher, JL was his first Hollywood experience, but not his first acting experience. He was a stage actor for years and on Broadway. I wonder if that influenced his expectations that he should be an artistic collaborator, not a tool. Yeah, probably. But I also think um, 100%, I think it's about the fact that he that Zack Snyder had built a certain um, mode of working with him, which was interactive. And so, and that's probably what he remembered from Broadway or what he had experienced on Broadway, which is very interactive. Uh, and so liked that for sure. Um, Greg, Greg Noir says, props, Roka. I love how you're covering the story. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> back to 1960 says, uh, I wasn't expecting to be choked. Damn, Roka, I wasn't expecting to be choking up when I started watching this. Thank you back. I guess it was talking about my dad. Uh, David Drano says, damn Roka, I can't imagine the catharsis of such a moment. I got an apology from a former boss who nearly ruined my career and felt something huge. Yeah, Dave. Yeah, yeah, David. It can be quite powerful. People should not underestimate the power of an apology, especially from someone you who had power over you or you respected. It's huge. An authentic apology, not an apology like, oh, hey, let me take you to lunch to apologize for what I did, even though I've never invited you to lunch in the three years that you worked for me. Sterling Jones says, wow, Roka, I sought out help when I was in the United States Air Force, spoke to an awesome chaplain. Afterwards, I wrote a letter to my father, the source of my anger. Man, let me tell you, it helped me so much. Absolutely. 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 All right. Um, I think that's it, right? I don't think <laughs> everyone's... All right, cool. I appreciate it. Uh, you guys have been fantastic. Let me get the hell out of here. I think there's one more here. Oh, uh, uh, Samanuske said, awful PR cyborg was one of the best things in Zack Snyder's Justice League. Yeah, I mean, the idea that he would call uh, um, Fisher a bad actor is ridiculous. 
Fisher was incredible in Zack Snyder's Justice League. And there's no way Zack Snyder went back in there and redirected a bunch of scenes with Ray Fisher. No. Nah. Ray Fisher was incredible in the movie, in Zack Snyder's version. And those are, that's a lot of the footage that he'd already shot with Ray. So whatever Joss's ideas were about his abilities, he was fucking wrong. Whatever test audience that they went to, because they don't specify what test audience they went to. Did they go to an ultra white conservative town where they pinpointed the black actor and said, oh, he's terrible. He's no good. Or did they go to a screening that had a multicultural group of people so they could determine what Ray Fisher's uh, abilities actually are? So it's just all kinds of bullshit that he's using to cover up the fact that Ray Fisher's role was cut to try to cover himself and not come off as racist, not come off as insensitive to race, if nothing else. Uh, it's ridiculous. So um, by, back to 1960 says, this is for sharing your personal story with us, Roka. Hit me hard. Thanks again. Of course, respect for you, brother. Thank you so much. I hope this was okay, y'all. Well, it was an hour and 40, 50 minutes. Good God almighty. Hey, my friend from high school, Rebecca says, you have a gift. You gave a gift to your dad as much as he did to you. Thanks, Rebecca. I appreciate that. Don't get me, don't get me crying. <clears throat> Thank you, Rebecca. Rebecca, that's my friend from high school. That is my friend from high school, ladies and gentlemen. It's very kind of her to be joining me live as we talk about this. All right, let's wrap it up here. You all got to get on with your days. I got to get on with you, my day as well. Much love to you all. Thank you so much for joining me here live. Please remember to hit a like on this video. Let me know what you thought of some of the comments that I had to say or the comments in this interview. And again, I can't encourage you enough. Read this thing in whole uh, from uh, uh, writer and interviewer Lila Shapiro. Uh, it's on Vulture's website right now. At Lila Pearl is her Twitter handle. So don't forget that. Give her some love. Follow her. Tell her that you enjoyed the article. Tell her what you liked about the article. Uh, and then leave a comment down below. Comments are so important. I can't stress this enough. If you've gotten to the end of this video, please leave comments down below. Leave a like down below. Share it on your social media so that other people see the content we're creating here on social media or on the channel, right? the Outlaw Nation channel. And subscribe to the channel down below. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that bell button so you see when we're dropping all the new content we do here on the Outlaw Nation channel. You guys are amazing. I didn't expect so many people to show up and hang out with me today. So thank you very much. My love to you all. Um, and to follow me at the Roka says on Twitter and on Instagram, I am on TikTok at the Roka says going to start posting some interviews, going to start posting some stuff. I saw Perry do that with her TikTok, and it just gave me ideas to do some stuff, clip out certain interviews from certain people to drop on certain days. So I'm going to do that going forward and work on that. So definitely the TikTok thing is going to start blowing up with the stuff I'm putting up there. Maybe I'll do some dances in the outlaw mask. I don't know. We'll see. Um, as far as Twitch, the outlaw nation, all one word on Twitch as well. And don't forget all my other podcasts, the top 10, the cinephiles, and of course the geek buddies all happening. All right. Have yourselves a great Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Please do what you can for yourselves to, to honor that man and honor what he brought onto this world, this idea of working together, this idea of understanding and being aware of the um, uh, systemic injustice that we uh, administer towards people of color and please towards black people specifically. And please be aware of that as we go forward in the future. Please embrace that. Please be an agent and instrument of change, even in a small way in your life and in the lives of people around you. It's important. It's important what one rock, one pebble, the waves it can cause in the world. You just never know. So I just want to send you all some love here on this Martin Luther King Jr. Day. All right. Love you all madly. Take care of yourselves. Be well. And we'll talk to you next time with another live Outlaw Nation episode and Outlaw Nation show here. Be well. Peace. Peace.